Um, let's get started. Let's see. Well, why are we doing this? Well, let's take a look at our current methodologies. Uh, we have traditionally finite different surfaces, and the reason why we have them is they're fast, especially for radiation, and they're accurate as long as your model fits into a box and a cylinder and a cone and a sphere. But if you have some shapes that don't quite fit that mold, it can be very difficult to model. So the other alternative is finite element methods, and uh, they work great uh, for arbitrary geometry. You can mesh anything. But if you have a lot of curved surfaces, you might end up with a lot of elements to capture that curved surface that you're modeling with little flat facets. And it can be uh, you know, very slow. It's fast to solve. Node, you know, it's about the same node for node as a finite difference network if you have the same nodal resolution. But uh, you're usually forced to use more than you'd like to. So there's some other alternatives. There's second order finite elements. Uh, they have a higher order approximation. So for the same element, they're more accurate. So you can use less of them. But um, you don't always get a benefit. They can be slower to solve. They're going to be slower to solve. If you look at a brick element, um, you'll have eight nodes on a linear element. And that'll give you an eight by eight conduction matrix. And if you uh, look at a second order brick element, you'll have 20 nodes. And that'll give you a 20 by 20 conduction matrix. So you see you get a lot more conductors going to Cinda. Um, it sometimes is a wash, sometimes it's slower, sometimes it's faster, but it's not always a no-brainer to use second-order elements because of the additional solution complexity. You're still solving for mid-side no temperatures. So what we've been working on for quite a while is a modeling approach that is appropriate for the kind of analysis tasks that we do. We want something that's fast and works for any kind of shape. So let's take a look exactly what these are. Um, it's a little different formulation than a typical finite element. It's what we kept was the second order shape functions for the geometry, but we keep we use a first order approximation for the temperature field across the element, and that reduces the amount of information that goes to Cinda, and it uh, makes it much faster. Uh, it's a control volume based approach. There's discrete control volumes used around every node and the heat flow is integrated across the surface using the gradient normal to that surface just like you would if you were doing hand calculations just like finite difference method except we're using a little bit more information than a finite difference method would use. So it works well with the rest of your model. You integrate it you can mix and match however you like. Um, but the main thing is that it's still about the same speed as a linear element. Um, the ray tracing methods are integrated. There's a couple methods for that. We'll talk about that. Um, and uh, well, how does it work? We're not going to get too much under the hood, but we eliminate the network, the thermal network from the mid sides using our super network techniques. We keep the mid-side node locations to define the shape, but then we and we compute a network based on a second temperature field. But then we eliminate those mid-side nodes using a super network, and then that those temperatures are reconstructed when we do post-processing or mapping. So just another little uh, uh, explanation of the control volume. You make a comment. These don't look that curved, but they are, um, and you can toggle views in thermal desktop, you can say, show me nodal control volumes. And it's the same model. It's just showing the graphics a little different. Highlighted there, uh, these, this element here is the same as this element here. In this view, we're just showing the nodal regions uh, for each node. What this element does here is it computes the terms that represent the heat flow from this node to this node across you know, this upper boundary right there. And it computes the heat flow from this node to this node across this little segment, this highlighted blue segment for this boundary. So instead of a finite difference approximation where we where we use just this temperature 
say, in this temperature, left and right, to do the heat flow across this entire boundary, we're going to use four temperatures to compute it across the segment. So each element contributes to multiple nodal control volume calculations, and it's all summed up together in SendUp. Uh, radiation, this is probably one of the main reasons why we did this. Uh, the radiation problems, or at least why I started thinking about it a long time ago, um, was to get the radiation speed up. But more and more we see people exercising the SINDA model over and over, optimizations and reliability analysis and you know lots of different design trades. So um, you know they're both important. Just getting your SINDA speed fast is almost as even more so these days than the radiation models. But the idea was we still want to have good radiation exchange with, with our curved elements. Uh, this is an example of a parabolic trough, say solar collector. And if you use flat elements, you have specular reflection, you're not going to quite get the behavior expected. Um, these elements do work. Now, uh, full disclosure here, there's two methods built in for radiation. There's one that's called exact. And that's the one that's being shown here. And that uses a Bezier clipping method to compute these intersections um, with the precise mathematical definition of this surface. There's another method where you can break these up into facets. They're area corrected, and uh, they, they embed the normals in them. So it's a little more accurate than just plain fat, uh, flat faceted finite element model. But it's also a lot faster. Um, these are eight order surfaces. And uh, the ray tracing time for a surface tends to be proportional to how many intersections you might have. So if you did a timing study with finite difference primitives, and you'd see that a, a cylinder was twice as slow as a, a rectangle, because you've got two possible intersection points. And you would see that a torus, or ogive, would be about four times slower than a rectangle, because you have four possible routes. So these tend, it's dependent on your geometry, to be about eight times slower with the exact method. But the uh, <clears throat> tessellation method is uh, very quick. It's comparable times to uh, finite different surfaces. Technically, these elements are called superparametric. And what that means is that the order of the approximations to the shape is higher than the order of approximation for the solution field. Um, <clears throat> most typical formulations are called isoparametrics, and uh, where, the, where the order is the same. But we've kind of broken that mold, and we've also used a control volume approximation. So um, it's a very custom formulation. You know, we wanted to call them thermal elements. Maybe, maybe you'll see them called curved thermal elements here and there. Um, same thing. Uh, CE, we've abbreviated for short, for FD for finite difference, and FD for finite elements. So we're working on some white papers, and we'll um, have more information on exactly how the radiation works and how the conduction model works. Um, but for now, we just kind of want to show where to use them, why we want to use them, what they can do, what they can't do. And uh, these are really the kind of models that they're designed for. Um, you know, even this model here, it's it's flat. It's a flat plate there, uh, but we've got curved holes in it. And there's other ways of doing it. You can use Booleans to cut them out, and you can play games with little black disks and make them inactive none and hide the nodes there to try to simulate you know, radiation going to nowhere to simulate a hole there. But you still have to modify the conduction network by hand. You either punch nodes out or deactivate nodes, or you, know, you still have to modify uh, the conduction network, and if you're doing it by hand and you're in a loop, you know you're going to make, you're going to forget. Um, it's slow. These models here, we, you just mesh them. You bring them into uh, TD Direct. You can modify them however you want. Either create the geometry from scratch, uh, which is what we did with the model on the right, or you import your design model, simplify it, and uh, and it's automatic. And when a change comes down the road, you just mesh again. You don't have to do a lot of stuff. So this is pretty much the meat here of what we want to talk about. We want to show a couple verification cases. We're going to do a little heated sphere and a half of a cylinder that's radiating to space. And uh, 
the main point we want to make is just to show you that your nodalization isn't driven by matching the geometric complexity. You can let the nodalization change depending on what you need on your problem. And uh, we want to talk a few other things about curved elements. If you have curved surfaces in close proximity, you can get some strange behavior. And we want to talk about contact conductance. And we want to talk about data mapping. It's another big advantage of using curved elements here in conjunction with TD Direct. All right, so the verification here, <clears throat> this first case is just a four inch cannonball. We're going to put it in ice water and then we'll drop it in boiling water and we'll watch the temperature of the center of the sphere as a function of time. And we'll compare these methods and see what we get. So these are the two models. A few more nodes in the finite difference one, but essentially the same nodalization. And we see pretty much the same results. Um, this is just the first hurdle to show you. Yeah, we've done tests and and uh, it looks good. You know, it's a curved formulation, but it, it works. Um, the main point here is that it's the same error. Um, we don't want to misrepresent that this is twice as accurate. You know, it, it's a second order method. It's not. It's a first order method like finite difference. <clears throat> The reason why they're about the same is they're, they both do a good job of capturing the mass and the area of a sphere here. If you have faceted representations, you have less area and you have less volume. Um, here's a little more interesting example. We've got a half a cylinder and we're going to take half of one edge and fix it at a temperature. We're going to make it shiny and low E on the inside and, and dark and diffuse on the outside. And we'll do a steady state solution. We'll look at how much power this thing radiates and we'll try it for three different methods and take a look at what happens as we change the resolution. So here we've got all three models at a fairly high resolution uh, and we get about the same results. If we would double this nodal resolution we'd probably see these results converge even closer. Um, so what's the advantage? Well, you know, is this really what we need for our problem? Um, well, it depends on the problem. <clears throat> if this was an uh, optical element and we were worried about image quality, this might not be enough. You know, we might be looking for millikelvin gradients and, and doing a stress deformation on it. Uh, and then, you know, using optical ray tracing to, to figure out the beam quality, we might need more. but. Those aren't always the problems we do. This, and when you're doing system level problems, you're answering system level questions. So how much, what's my power budget? You know, what size radiator do I need? And so on. So this, you know, might be overkill. If this were in a larger vehicle level model, you might end up with an intractable situation if everything was meshed this way. So let's see how it looks when we make it a little less dense. So here's kind of a medium resolution. And we can see the answers are still pretty similar, but we're starting to deviate a little bit with the finite element model. Uh, it's um, starting to not look like a cylinder is the main problem. And uh, it's still not bad. This would still be acceptable, but even so, this might be overkill for, you know, the, for the problem at hand here. Here's a, a level that you might find appropriate for your system level model here. And you can see that the results are starting to deviate a little more significantly here, about 8% for the finite element versus about 2 for the other methods. It's, uh, you know, it's, the reason is it's just not a cylinder anymore. And you start getting artifacts in addition to the numerical approximations. They're both, say, a first order temperature solution, but the geometry that we're working with is starting to deviate. So there's a lower limit when you get to finite elements of a resolution. As long as you're doing a very detailed model, it, it really doesn't matter. Uh, but when you want to use you know, a minimum amount of nodes to get the answer, you're kind of stuck with finite, finite element methods. So. so that's the main idea here, that you know, our, our finite different surfaces, you can't always model the geometry you want. Um, at finite elements, 
are great for arbitrary modeling, but you often need a lot more than you really need. Um, the idea here is that we can you can pick your nodalization that matches your finite difference like nodal density that, that you want to use. So here's that same cylinder there. Maybe this is a heat shield for a motorcycle or something. And uh, suppose it had these holes in it. It gets a little tougher to model with finite difference surfaces. And again, you can always play tricks with it. Uh, we've been doing it for a long time, but it's just slow. This one here, this didn't take any longer to do than the simple cylinder here. Um, it uh, put it into TD Direct, cut some holes in it, rounded the corners, and it's already hooked up in my thermal desktop drawing. Just hit resync, and I got a new model. So it's uh, very, very easy to do arbitrary geometry. <clears throat> Here's another example here. Even with about a double mesh resolution for flat elements, you can see that it's still kind of chunky in the background there. Um, you get really good curved approximations with these elements. Um, they make nice models, and it's um, not technical in nature, but uh, when you're standing up in front of a critical design review and you've got high-paid consultants whose job it is to shoot you down and that know nothing about thermal, you know, good-looking models add a little credibility, too, so never discount a pretty picture. Same point, if you wanted to do a finite element, arbitrary geometry, and you wanted to use it, you know, a nodalization that you find appropriate if you could use finite difference, you'd find you'd be running into problems with the geometry. And if you use a density of good enough to capture the features you were looking for, you, you're probably going to run too slow. So this curved elements gives you that choice to, to have a coarse mesh and still get good results. I right, know there's a few other advantages besides just this geometric fidelity. We've talked a lot about that. Um, there's a few other things that work really well in conjunction with our other tools. Um, we'll take a look at what happens when you have close curved surfaces, and uh, we'll take a look at thermal contact, which is a big part of what we do. And we'll take a look at data mapping. So here's this first situation with surface intersection. We have a, a couple spheres inside a cylinder here. And if we nodalize this very coarsely, we see we get this strange artifact. The elements in the sphere start poking through the outside of the cylinder here. And you might get artificial view to space, um, you know, other unacceptable modeling errors besides just a poor approximation to the mass and area. On the right here, I increased I kept increasing the resolution until I didn't see this interface, you know, this intersection poking through anymore. And so this is the minimum resolution just to avoid that situation. And uh, we end up with, you know, about 10 times as many nodes and 35 times as many rad Ks. Here's the curve model. The same density as the model in the middle there. Um, 288 nodes versus over 3,000. And if we look at the run times here, these are two separate models, two separate thermal models. And, uh, you know, radiation results were 30 times slower, and the cinder run was about 10 times slower. And this was, you know, just a simple example uh, that we did that, you know, ran pretty quick on my machine. But if, if it were a you know, say it was uh, an hour for the model on the left, that's still a day and a half for the model on the right. And you're not going to get uh, too many mission scenarios analyzed, and you're not going to get too many design traits and kind of turnaround time. All right, uh, let's talk about contact. Even if you have models with simple finite difference shapes, you know, rectangles and even rectangles on rectangles, you you can run into problems when the nodal areas don't match up. Um, in TD Direct, we have a mesh matching feature that produces identical meshes on either side of the contact, and that'll show you in it. That'll that helps avoid what we call a short circuit problem here. On the left is a detailed 
find, find a difference model. And uh, we're, we put five watts into the cylinder, and we look, we're looking for the peak temperature. We see it's about 53 degrees on the left here. And then on the right is a course model. Same uh, boundary condition, same heat load, and we get about 48 and a half degrees. So it's about 8% off. If we look at the curve model, nodal density is the one on the upper right. Um, we get a little better accuracy. We're about 52 degrees, 52.7 degrees. So why is that? Um, when you have a high contact condition, it swaps out, you know, it swamps out the lateral conduction. If you look right here, you see that this cylinder is just hanging off the edge here. It's just barely making contact with this, with this nodal region here. But if this contact is a lot higher than, say, the lateral conduction from neighboring nodes on this plate, it's going to drive this center node of this plate to be the same temperature as the bottom of this cylinder. And you can see this artificial spreading of this of that contact condition over this whole this whole area here. But if you make the meshes the same here, you have a one-to-one -one matchup of nodes and you have a one-to-one -one matchup of nodal areas. And you will have nodes at this boundary of the contact that give you that lateral conduction. Here we have a we insert a node here and make sure we get lateral conduction effects to, to the neighboring points here. So um, we've eliminated this you know, short circuit effect. And this is true even if it wasn't a, a cylinder, you know, just a box on a plate will show this effect as well. Now for data mapping, uh, more and more this is becoming part of standard practice, either consuming data from uh, CFD models for boundary conditions and heat fluxes, and then mapping them back into the structures model you know, for their job. This has always been the case with finite difference models. That just that They're just not the same. And you play a lot of games to try to match up um, your cylinders and cones to match up with the stress model. And uh, neighboring regions, you know, might get the wrong points, so you have to set up groups to isolate different ones to make sure only these thermal surfaces go to these stress elements. And even so, you can get errors from extrapolation. Or, you know, if you don't want to extrapolate and you want to snap, you can get errors when you snap to a surface. So either way, when the models don't line up, you, you have to deal with some, some issues. And if you're doing it by hand, then again, that's a, a slow process. So if you're using the curved elements, and especially TD Direct, both all models can be based off the same CAD model. You know, we the curved elements let you use the finite element method here. It lets you mesh this CAD model, and your stress guys can build their models how they want, and you can build your models how you want. And the difference is, even if you know, if this was flat elements, we'd still see a deviation between these two models. But the curved elements everywhere match the geometry well, the original CAD model. So when we go to map results, you know, these small little points here, as long as you're mapping vertice to vertice, there's a stress vertex that probably corresponds exactly to this vertex over here someplace, and uh, that's going to map perfectly. But these nodal points, or the stress grid points that map, say, in the middle of an element, if this were a flat element, a stress grid point would be hovering above it. We'd have to do some kind of interpolation extrapolation to get the results. Um, you know, it's not bad, but uh, here it's pretty much exact because these points are going to map perfectly onto these curved elements and give you a really good mapping. And again, when design changes come down, you import a new CAD model. You've got everything set up with domains and thermal desktop. You just resync and you get a new model. And now your new model matches the stress guy's new model. What usually happens is you know, you could build this model out of cylinders and, and toruses and, you know, probably get a pretty good results, but it probably took you a long time. Then the design change comes and you might, well, I don't want to build a whole new model. Maybe I'll just, I'll scale the conductivity in this direction here and that'll work. And that'll give you a good thermal result, but then it gets harder and harder to match the geometric, you know, congruency between these two models. 
And that's what usually happens over time. You know, the models drift. The thermal model gets way out of sync with the structure, structures model because, you know, you can't keep pace with those geometric changes. And now you can. So to summarize, if we look at models with the same nodal resolution, you know, curved elements, they show equivalent or better accuracy than finite difference surfaces. We don't want to claim they're twice as accurate as finite difference, but there is some advantage in the conduction network formulation. The, the particular control volume formulation uses some you know, more terms than a finite difference, but you know, mathematically they're equivalent accuracy. And they work well because they both approximate surface area and mass properties very well. Linear elements start to show a lot more error as you reduce the nodal density. As it starts to deviate from the actual geometric shape, we see more, more and more error. And it's just not tractable for system level models. We just can't do hundreds of thousands of nodes uh, of models and, and have it in an optimization loop or run mission scenarios or do what if scenarios. It just doesn't work. So these elements, they work well. They let you model complex geometry when finite difference just doesn't fit, but you can retain the finite difference like speed if your problem warrants it. Again, if you need a, a more accurate, you need more nodal density, then you need more de nodal density. But when you don't need that nodal density, here at least you have an option. You, you can use it. So same idea, finite difference, it's great if you have geometry that fits that mold. When you don't, you'll end up using finite elements. You need a lot to capture those curved regions. And now you know. Now you can pick a, a resolution that matches your problem at hand, which is more what we do. And that's about it. So uh, any questions, welcome to answer. Okay, thanks, Tim. We've got uh, a couple of questions coming in here, so I appreciate everyone's patience as I uh, get to them. Uh, the first uh, question uh, written in is, when will curved elements be available in TD? Uh, they are. They're there, they're there right now. So to answer, to answer that specifically, uh, curved elements were introduced in 5.7 of TD Direct and supported in 5.7 of Thermal Desktop, uh, but we've been continuing to expand them and make improvements, so we weren't uh, loud about them until uh, 5.8 was released. So if you're interested in them, I would start with the 5.8 version, but they've 5.8 was released uh, almost a year ago now. Um, there was a uh, hand raised. I take it someone retract that, retracted that. So I'm going to go back to. Oh no, nope, here it is again. Uh, Dave Sullivan, I'm going to take you off mute so you can ask a question. Go ahead. Okay, he's back on mute there. Um, so getting back to other questions, uh, when would not using curved elements be better? Interesting question. Well, I think if you look at that initial cylinder there, um, you see that uh, the results kind of converge to the same when you have a very high nodal density. So it, it's not um, a penalty. You'll get the same answers as finite, you know, regular linear elements as your nodal density gets finer and finer. You know, as soon as the, you know, individual elements don't need to be curved and you get them fine enough to approximate the geometry, then the curved finite elements are equivalent to the linear elements. They, they degenerate into the same one. And uh, it may be a fractionally faster to use linear elements. The curved elements are just about as fast as the linear ones, but um, if you wanted to compare them, you'd probably see a, a little bit of speed improvement. Okay, and, and so, Boris, you had a question that was very similar, so I'm going to assume that answered that one too, but if uh, not, please ask it again. Otherwise, uh, getting uh, several questions along the common thread of how do you get to curved meshes, mesh, meshes excuse me, is TD Direct the only way to get there? 
Yes. Practically, that's the best answer is that you really need TD Direct. You can build elements by hand. What TD Direct does the meshing. They create the second order shapes and nodal points and mid-side points. Thermal Desktop does all the other work. Thermal Desktop computes the conduction network and Thermal Desktop does the radiation calculations. There's a few other things that come along with TD Direct that you're not going to get with other mesh meshers. One is the normals. The surface normals generated from the CAD surface are also brought into Thermal Desktop and those can be used when you create insulation or material stacks that have a significant thickness, we're going to we displace that those element. We create new elements displaced from the surface along those normals, and so it accurately captures radial divergence and things. We have material orienter capabilities. Um, there's an orienter built into every nodal point with a curved element. If you have a s small flat element, you can say, yeah. Um, and you have anisotropic conditions, you can say, yes, the material doesn't change across this element. But if you have large curved elements, you need to interpolate the local coordinate system for your material orienter across there. So we have, you can pick edges and curves and TD direct and say, use this to align my anisotropic properties. So in practical cases, you, you're going to want to use TD direct. You can build elements by hand one by one, but that'll probably be more painful than trying to do a finite difference model. Um, it's there primarily for testing and uh, you know, investigating you know, elements if you want to play around with it. You can also import an Astran mesh. Uh, I don't know if it's been released yet as a patch, but um, I have added second order elements to Nastran to do some more testing on them. Um, but you're going to miss out on some of the specific formal features that we've added into TD Direct. Thanks, Tim. So uh, other threads of questions asking, how do I get to curved elements? So I've taken over the screen here just to show you a uh, TD Direct screen. And at the top level, without any object selected, if I just hit Mesh Control and go to Advanced Default, this is the button right here that controls it all. Uh, which I, I think is a little bit funny to have uh, so much work gone to uh, one button, but that's how you turn on curved meshing. So in this uh, geometry that's shown here, if I had done no defeaturing and, and other cleanup, which probably wouldn't be a good idea, but let's say I didn't, uh, things like this uh, and this would be uh, come across as curved, uh, that hole there, and the other parts, of course, wouldn't. Uh, so just clicking that button enables curve meshing at the whole level. And again, that's at the top level. If I were to pick a part or surface, I'm now getting the local mesh control. And curve meshing is not something you select at that point. So hopefully uh, that answered that question. And I think that that also, uh, the, the answers that have been given, I think in general, answer a lot of the other questions that are coming in. So if, um, let's see, here's another one. This be for you, Tim. Is there a significant difference between 2D curved elements and 3D curved elements, for example, as they get thinner? Um, different in what way? I mean, we have both 3D curved elements and 2D curved elements. There's a, an element quality you should be aware of, of course, you know, just because you can make a curved element as big as you want. You know, you have to look and see if it is matching the accuracy of what you need. So I guess in, in general, since you have more degrees of freedom for a three-dimensional curved element, you can um, you can make it more distorted, I suppose. Um, but I guess I don't really quite understand the question. Sure. If you want to clarify you... that question, uh, go ahead and raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Otherwise... Uh... We'll move on. Um, are there any other questions here that have not been answered, or if the answers that were given weren't uh, adequate, please either uh, raise your hand or ask it in the question panel. And of course, if you have a question that you're not quite sure you haven't formulated yet, you'd like to ask it offline. Uh, Tim's uh, pitch there on the cover sheet had his email address. 
or of course you can always write into support at sierratech.com uh, for any clarifications or anything uh, that wasn't uh, answered there.